Hey, what's going on you guys? It's Ace Asai, and today I'm bringing you guys video number three. So part three of six of uh, Epic History TV's Napoleonic Wars. Um, so I'm super excited. I'm loving this part of history and I love this channel. If you guys haven't checked them out, go check them out. I'll post the original link down in the description. There is one other thing. I always get permission to use people's videos. Um, so I just want to let you know when the conditions on using this video was that it can't be a full-size, full-screen video, so it is about 60%. I still think it looks fantastic, but I hope you guys appreciate it. And uh, make sure you don't miss my other videos. I do post daily, so hit that sub button, ring the bell, and I'm just going to shut up so we can get started, all right? One week before Christmas, 1806, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte arrived in the Polish city of Warsaw, then part of Prussia. Ah, oh, dude, I know war never sleeps, but a week before Christmas, could you imagine being the people of Warsaw? I mean, uh, if you're not pro-Napoleon at least, it just, that'd kind of ruin your Christmas. A year had passed since his great victory over the Austrians and Russians at Austerlitz and two months since he'd hammered the Prussians at Jena. But Russia still had powerful forces in the field, the most important of which was the Russian First Army, commanded by General Bennigsen. Napoleon would not be master of Europe until it was defeated, and Russia and Prussia forced to make peace. But that winter, Napoleon's first attempt to trap Bennigsen near Potusk got bogged down in thick Polish mud. The Russians withdrew to Białystok. The French army, half starved and frozen, was ordered into winter quarters. While in Warsaw... No yeah, I was just kind of thinking, um, you don't want to fight in Russia in the winter, you know? It, uh, or I guess Poland. Um, it just, it would be too cold, wouldn't it? Unless you had a lot of proper winter gear. And uh, that's a lot of soldiers to give gear to, so. Napoleon began a famous affair with a young Polish noblewoman, Marie Walewska. In the late 18th century, the once mighty Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been swallowed up by its neighbors, Russia, Austria, and Prussia in a series of annexations known as Partitions. Until in 1795, a third and final partition wiped Poland off the map. Huh. Now, Polish patriots looked to Napoleon as their saviour, praying that his victories against their occupiers would lead to the rebirth of a Polish state. Very interesting. Marie Walewska became Napoleon's mistress in order to further this cause. Ordinary French soldiers, however, had little love for Poland. It was impoverished, freezing, and they missed home. Desertion rates soared. There were even a hundred cases of suicide. Hey, uh, back in those days, if you were part of the French army and you deserted, does anybody know, let me know in the comments, does anybody know what happened to you, what your punishment was if you were caught as a deserter? Um, yeah, just wondering. Marshal Ney, commanding 6th Corps, sent patrols towards Heilsberg, looking for better quarters. What they found were Russian and Prussian soldiers on the move. They'd stumbled into a surprise winter attack by Bennigsen. Napoleon quickly laid a trap for the Russian army, ordering Ney and Bernadotte to retreat and lure Bennigsen west, while he led the rest of the army north to fall on his flank and rear. But the Russians captured a French courier carrying the Emperor's orders to Marshal Bernadotte. Bennigsen, now warned of the trap, ordered a retreat, fighting a series of rearguard skirmishes against the pursuing French. But he refused to give up the city of Königsberg 
without a fight. Okay. And turn to give battle at Eilau. The Battle of Eilau, fought over two days, was one of the most brutal of the Napoleonic Wars. Fought in freezing conditions, with neither side backing down. Marshal Augereau's 7th Corps, advancing into the face of a snowstorm, lost its way and was cut to pieces by Russian cannon fire. Wow. Five French eagles were lost. Uh, maybe you guys can remind me again, The what's the French eagles? Is that uh, those members of the elite guard, I guess? Um, or, or what is that? I know somebody knows. There's a couple of people that watch these videos that you guys just... You know everything about the Napoleonic era, so uh, let me know what you think. Or I guess let me know what the answer is. Napoleon's army was only saved by a devastating massed cavalry charge by 10,000 horsemen, led by the fearless Marshal Murat, and remembered as one of the great cavalry charges in history. At Eilau, for the first time as emperor, Napoleon failed to win a clear victory on the battlefield. He and the Russians covered up the true scale of their losses, but both sides are estimated to have lost a third of their armies wow. in the carnage. After the horrors of Eilau, both armies sought time to rest and recover. Meanwhile, the newly formed French 10th Corps under Marshal Lefebvre besieged Danzig, held by 13,000 Prussians under General Kalkruth. The city came under heavy French bombardment and infantry assault. After eight weeks, with no prospect of reinforcement, the Prussian garrison surrendered on the 27th of May. Napoleon's northern sea flank was now secure against any possible Russian landing. The French Emperor now commanded an army 190,000 strong. Wow. against just 115,000 Russian and Prussian troops. 190,000, that's nearly as much as is in my city, uh, my hometown, that's, that's interesting. That's, uh, that's a third of what's in uh, Seattle, uh, the next town over, and uh, it's a hell of a lot of people. I mean, honestly, Jesus Christ, man, and they're all soldiers, all fighting. That's incredible. But it was Bennigsen who moved first, launching a surprise attack against Ney's 6th Corps on the 5th of June. Ney conducted a brilliant fighting withdrawal and escaped. Bennigsen, having lost the element of surprise, and with Napoleon advancing, retreated once more. Four days later at Heilsberg, the French lost 10,000 men in a botched assault against Russian defences. But the Russians continued their retreat the next day. Napoleon thought Bennigsen would head north to Königsberg, but instead he retreated northeast, keeping to the east bank of the Aller River. So when Napoleon's army marched north, it was Marshal Land's reserve corps on his right flank that next encountered the Russian army near the small town of Friedland. The Reserve Corps, though, was uh, kind of, uh, what, elite soldiers, though, right? For the most part, more battle experienced, I believe. Um, he tried not to use them too much, but uh, they knew what the hell they were doing, so even though they're outnumbered, I could still see them as possibly winning this. Let me know what you guys think. In fact, pause the video right now, let me know as a comment if you guys think they're going to win this battle or not. And no cheating, if you know what's going to happen, don't say anything. <laughs> In the late afternoon of the 13th of June, Russian cavalry scouts informed General Bennigsen that they'd found a single French corps at Friedland. Bennigsen decided he had time to cross the Aller River and smash this isolated corps, before the rest of the French army could arrive to save it. And he ordered his army to begin crossing the river. Interesting. 
Marshal Lannes, commanding 16,000 men and facing 46,000 Russians, sent an urgent message to Napoleon that he was under attack from the main Russian army. Then he fought a skillful delaying action, hiding the weakness of his force behind a large screen of skirmishers, while gradually yielding ground to the enemy. Lan was That's still really holding smart. off the Russians as darkness fell. That night, Russian engineers built three pontoon bridges at Friedland to speed the movement of troops over the river. But Bennigsen was taking a huge risk. If this turned into a major battle, his army would have to fight with its back to the river and the steep banks of the mill stream dividing its left wing from its right. Hmm. Bennigsen had also badly underestimated the speed at which Napoleon's Grande Armée would react. The first French reinforcements arrived that night. Wow, that's The quick. Emperor himself wasn't far behind. Dawn on the 14th of June, about 40,000 Russians had crossed to the west bank of the Alle River. Bennigsen ordered an attack on the village of Heinrichsdorf to turn the French left flank. But French cavalry reinforcements, led by General Grouchy, intercepted the Russians. Okay. In more than an hour of charge and countercharge, the French horsemen finally drove the Russians back. Marshal Mortier's 8th Corps now arrived to reinforce the French centre. Now there's what, one, two, three, four corps, or I guess three corps in a reserve corps? Uh, yeah, four corps. Uh, wow, that's uh, quite the change, and now he's got his back to a river, split troops. This isn't looking good for the Russians. Not at all. In Sortlak Wood, General Udino's elite grenadier division fought stubbornly against Prince Bagration's left wing, but was outnumbered by the Russians and gradually pushed back. Around noon on a sweltering day, Napoleon himself arrived. He was soon followed by 1st Corps, commanded by General Victor, standing in for the wounded Marshal Bernadotte, as well as Ney's 6th Corps and the Imperial Guard under Marshal Bessières. The date, the 14th of June, held special significance for Napoleon. It was the 7th anniversary of his great victory over the Austrians at Marengo, a good omen, he declared. The battle then entered a lull as Napoleon assessed the situation, saw Bennigsen's... <laughs> is he just using it so that he could have a steady eye? Is that what it is? Rest on his shoulder for a steady eye, I guess? Because if you're holding it out kind of like this, you know, you, uh, I guess you kind of shake a little bit, but if, uh, if you rest on somebody's shoulder... It's a lot more steady, or is he using him as like a shield? <laughs> Let me know what you guys think. It's dangerous position, and issued orders for an attack to take advantage of it. Bennigsen, meanwhile, who was tormented by ill health throughout the day, saw that he now faced the full might of Napoleon's army, and issued orders for a retreat. But before Bennigsen's retreat could get underway, at 5.30 p.m., three salvos from the French guns signalled the start of Napoleon's attack. It was led by Ney's 6th Corps on the right wing, 
who first cleared Bagration's infantry from Sotlak Wood. But as Ney's troops left the cover of the trees, they came under heavy fire from Russian cannon across the river. As the French attack faltered, Prince Bagration rallied his men and launched a cavalry counterattack. Ney's corps retreated. But now General Victor's 1st Corps came up on his left. Its artillery commander, General Senarmont, advanced with 30 guns and blasted the Russians at point-blank range with case shot. I know that the whole uh, Russian army is kind of trapped here with the river, but specifically these troops right here, they, uh, of... whoops, sorry. They, uh, they're kind of screwed. I mean, I guess... They can defend from one section, but you can't defend against a whole army. Russians were mown down within minutes. Under this onslaught, Bagration's men began to waver and then retreat. Around 7pm, the Russian Imperial Guard launched a desperate counterattack to try to halt the French advance on Friedland. But they were outnumbered and outgunned. As exploding shells began to start fires in Friedland, the French centre and left wing joined the attack. With its only escape route under threat, the entire Russian army began a panicked retreat towards the river. But Friedland's houses and bridges were now ablaze. The town became a deadly trap for the Russians. Many were drowned, trying to cross the river. Others killed or captured. Wow. North of Friedland, some units were able to escape across a... I know you're being shot at and everything, and uh, I've never been to war, so I can't really talk. Um, but a lot of these troops are trying to go for the bridge instead of just beelining it for the river. I mean, you can make it across that river. I mean, it might be really, really... Uh, swift it might be really deep might be i guess it was cold wasn't it a frozen river oh god there's so many problems with that yeah maybe not that's a tough situation i don't know what i'd do the ford or along the river bank but there was no disguising the russians terrible defeat The Battle of Friedland was one of the most decisive victories of Napoleon's career. At the cost of 10,000 casualties, he had inflicted twice as many losses on the Russians. About 20,000 men, killed, wounded or taken prisoner. 40% of Bennigsen's army. It's pretty good. The Prussians abandoned Königsberg the next day which was occupied by Soult's 4th Corps, while Bennigsen's shattered army retreated across the river Niemen into Russia. Tsar Alexander's advisers implored him to make peace with Napoleon. He accepted their advice, and a ceasefire was agreed. Okay. Alexander and Napoleon met for the first time aboard a raft in the middle of the river Niemen, near Tilsit, and developed an immediate rapport. Tilsit proved to be one of history's great diplomatic summits, as the two emperors fated each other for days, with banquets, parades and concerts, then discussed affairs late into the night. A friendship of sorts developed. While Russia's former ally, King Frederick William of Prussia, was left out in the cold. And it was Prussia who would lose That's most of the treaties of Tilsit, signed two weeks later. One third of Prussian territory was taken away to create the new Kingdom of Westphalia, to be ruled by... That, uh, it actually makes sense that uh, Prussia lost out the most, you know? They're the ones who had their land already taken. They're lucky they got anything, you know? Uh, interestingly enough, why did they get to keep this section? It's kind of cut off from everything else, you know? 
by Napoleon's 22-year-old brother, Jérôme, and the Duchy of Warsaw, to be ruled by the King of Saxony, which Polish patriots hoped would prove a stepping stone on the road to their own state. Polish troops were recruited into the Grande Armée, with Polish lancers even forming part of Napoleon's elite Imperial Guard. Very cool. Russia only had to give up the Ionian Islands. As Alexander accepted an alliance with Napoleon, that left the French Emperor master of Europe. Alexander even agreed to join the Continental System, Napoleon's economic blockade of Great Britain, which banned British ships and goods from all French-controlled ports. Wow. The system had been established the previous winter by Napoleon's Berlin Decree. Napoleon hoped that by cutting off British trade with Europe, he'd cause financial chaos and political upheaval in Britain, allowing him to make a favourable peace. There was just one problem. The continental system didn't work. Not only was it impossible to enforce and undermined by widespread smuggling, the system damaged French trade just as much as British trade. The decisive weapon in this economic war would prove to be the British Royal Navy, which that summer ensured its continued naval dominance by launching a... That actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, the Navy is so strong and you have to cross a lot of water in order to get there. ...preemptive strike against the neutral Danish fleet at Copenhagen, capturing their warships before they could fall into Napoleon's hands. Royal Navy squadrons blockaded all major French ports, seizing any ships trading with France, while ensuring British merchants could continue to trade overseas in relative safety. The Navy even seized the tiny Danish island of Heligoland <laughs> as a base for smuggling British goods into Europe. But most disastrously for Napoleon, the continental system would draw him into two conflicts that proved ruinous for his empire. The first would be fought in the Iberian Peninsula, where Napoleon decided to force Britain's ally, Portugal, to join the continental system. In November 1807, French troops, supported by their Spanish ally, invaded the country. The Portuguese royal family fled to their colony of Brazil as the French occupied Lisbon without a fight. Hmm. It looked at They really just up and ran? I understand you don't want to face the uh, Le Grand Armée, you know? But, uh... Come on. <laughs> You're just gonna abandon? You're supposed to be the representative of that country. At least stick around and make some type of a deal or something, you know? Try to negotiate, don't just take off. Let me know if this is actually how that went down, you guys, because I know a lot of you know a lot more about this type of history. Um, let me know if uh, they're just kind of simpli simplifying it, I guess, um, or what, what happened. It was as though Napoleon had won yet another easy victory. But the Peninsular War was just beginning. All right. Uh, let's have a talk about that, you guys. So, what'd you think? Um, I know that was a little bit longer of one, so I'll keep this end short. But uh, he's really advancing well. I don't trust the alliance with Russia. But uh, that might just be that I'm an American and we have a lot of, uh, I guess, rocky history with Russia. Uh, but, I don't know. You know, um... At the end of the day, I think he's doing an excellent job. I think he's uh, really pushing for what he wants. But uh, I, I always heard that one of the reasons that he kind of fell was he tended to get a little bit too greedy. And uh, we'll just have to see. There's still three more parts. So, again, if you guys haven't subscribed, make sure you hit that sub button and ring the bell. Because, I, I mean, I want you guys here and I want you to see my videos. I post them every day. So, hope you stick around with me. Till next time, this is Ace I love y'all. And I'm out.